Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, for those online, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, this session uh, is on e-learning, and uh, the title is Accessible e-learning experience for persons with disability, best practice. And we are having a few little technical difficulties, so I apologize for starting late. Um, uh, we have, uh, I, my name is Gunnela Astbrink, and I'm moderating this session. And uh, I am chair of the Inter Internet Society Accessibility Standing Group. And uh, here next to me on site is Vidya Y. And, uh, uh, she will be speaking about her experiences of e-learning in India. Uh, we should have on online uh, our other speakers. Uh, we should have Swaran Ravindra from the Fiji National University, uh, who is the organizer of this session, and uh, Zakari Yama, uh, who is a co-organizer of a session. He is from Morocco. And uh, also Vashka Bhattacharji uh, from Bangladesh, as well as Jackie Huggins, um, who is uh, joining us from the Caribbean. So uh, while we are waiting for them to join us online, um, this, this session is really about how persons with disability can get best access to e-learning platforms and the importance of the e-learning to be available to persons with disability uh, across the world. And how can we, how can we make this possible? So it's going to challenge, uh, we're going to talk about some of the pressing challenges pertaining to technology and accessibility that persons with disabilities face when accessing online content on major e-learning platforms. And we in the Accessibility Standing Group actually have personal experiences of that. We're going to talk about supportive legislative frameworks and how we can adapt strategies to assist um, from the academic, the private sector and government institutes so that there's much more inclusion when creating online platforms because we know that if, if any uh, online service is created accessibly from the start, it is much more effective and efficient and also a lot more cost effective. So I'm going to um, pass over to um, Video Y and, um, and talk about a little bit of her personal experiences, both um, in the past as a young blind person navigating the, um, the education system and also talking about the current situation uh, with e-learning through the Internet Society. So I'll pass on over now to Vidya. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be talking uh, to you today. Thanks uh, to the organizers for having me here. Uh, and uh, thanks to Gunella. Um, so um, about e-learning platforms, I would like to talk a little bit about my own experiences with e-learning and also what I see working with children in India. So I run a nonprofit called Vision Empower. We make STEM education accessible to children with disabilities. So I will be talking mostly from their perspective and also my own challenges um, growing up with a disability, specifically on the e-learning platforms. Uh, I was born blind, so initial few years, uh, I didn't have access to technology as much because of lack of awareness. There were technologies, but I was not using them. I got access to a computer only in uh, grade 11. And since then, as we all know, it has huge opportunities. Um, you know, till then, if I had to communicate, I had to ask somebody to, uh, if I had to even send a WhatsApp, uh, if I had to send any message, it had to be, if I had to uh, have a written communication with a person who can see, 
then it would be someone else typing it for me or I could never have a written communication. So for the first time when I used email is when I got access to written communication. That was the first time someone could read what I had written. Otherwise, it had to be in Braille, which most of the persons who can see do not know. So we know how huge the impact of internet is on a person with, uh, on the life of persons with disabilities. Even if you have to browse something independently, it's all through the internet. And e-learning is not an exception because already classrooms are not very accessible. Uh, so a lot of things you'll have to come home and refer. For example, when I was studying computer science, I just would go to the class and then come back home and that's about it. I had to find my own, uh, find volunteers who could help me after classes. Now when you talk about e-learning, uh, firstly there are few challenges, especially in subjects like STEM. You know, a lot of the times uh, the content itself is not so accessible. Like everything is designed in a way that uh, a person with sight can understand. Now, when you take school textbooks, for example, so a lot of things are like, look around, there's a lot of greenery, or this is in the shape of a mountain. So a person who has never seen it, they wouldn't know what they're talking about. It's, content itself is written in a way that persons without sight cannot understand it easily. The second challenge is with uh, issues with regarding when I'm talking about STEM, so you have a lot of, uh, now if you have to read a math equation, it has to be written in a specific, specific format, like your uh, LaTeX format and other things, which a screen reader can read. But a lot of times, if you just give a PDF, if you upload PDF onto your LMS platforms, they're not very easily accessible. It just reads something like, if you want to write two square, it reads something, uh, two uh, superscript something or subscript something, things like this which you don't understand. So if it has to read well, you have to write it in a way that is accessible. And thirdly, uh, there's, there are accessibility issues with the web platform itself. Sometimes there are unlabeled buttons, sometimes there you cannot navigate, it just says link and you don't know what's the link all about. Uh, even if you, uh, a lot of times what I've seen is if you open a PDF file, uh, it just says page one, page two, and you don't know what's on that page. So a lot of times they're protected, you cannot download those files, so you cannot read them later. So there are challenges with the content, there are challenges with the accessibility, and with STEM it's even more complicated. How do you put on, put up charts or diagrams which uh, a child can, a child or a student can understand. You know, everything has to be all text, and there are a lot of challenges. So, um, you know, when we take, when these are the challenges that I had navigating on some of these platforms, including when I was doing a course on Internet Society, it was not very easy to navigate. All said and done, these are the challenges that are accessibility specific. But one thing also I wanted to mention is there's much more than accessibility. You know, when you take school education system in India, for example, when pandemic happened, a lot of schools seamlessly shifted onto the digital platforms. But it was not the case for children in India and the teachers because you can't tell them go to YouTube and refer how to install Zoom how to use Zoom, because everything says click here. So when you don't use mouse, it's not of any value to you. So I had to make my digital literacy tutorials in various languages for the teachers and students to use. And also we have our own accessible learning management platform called Suboda. Now some of the ground realities that I have seen getting the children and teachers onto these platforms are even little bit more than accessibility actually. Uh, one thing is making a platform accessible. Second thing is the digital literacy training that you'll have to give them. Third thing is you have to ensure that there is some mechanism to handhold the teachers or the students or to get new users with disabilities onto the platform. Because with so many challenges, it's not very easy to be continuously motivated to get onto the platform. And after you get on, they encounter some or the other challenges. There needs to be somebody to handhold them and make it very comfortable. Because uh, 
even in, even in our uh, on our um, accessible platform that we have teachers wanted some other features like they wanted phone so it's very important to get uh, they wanted an app so it's very important to get their perspectives as well and make changes as they like as we say right nothing about us without us so we need to involve them in the process of making the platform accessible and handhold them so that they are comfortable in the usage of these platforms so these are some of my thoughts that i wanted to share Thank you very much, Vidya. There is a lot there to take to take on, to consider, and uh, from uh, uh, Vidya's uh, personal experience. Uh, I'll pass on now over to Jacqueline Huggins, uh, uh, who uh, has the experience of supporting students uh, in, uh, in her university. So please go ahead, Jackie. Right. Hi. Well, from here, I'm saying good night. <laughs> and um, exactly what was just said by the last speaker. Um, what happens on our campus, though, is that we have a policy. And that policy is what is used to encourage lecturers, academic staff to do what is right for the student. And our department is almost like a watchdog in terms of a student who has visual impairment, who is blind, is registered with the campus, we then work with that student. And we work with lecturers so that they understand um, content not being accessible is very important. It is something that we always have to sit one-on-one -on -one and speak to lecturers about why it needs to be done. And we have students also speaking with the lecturers. This is what my needs my need is. So the lecturer has a better understanding. We have had the issues where students have to deal with graphs, students have to do with calculations, and lecturers had to become creative. So sometimes we're not even able to use the online platform. We have to use lecturer and student talking it through, finding solutions that is not necessarily online. Um, in terms of when COVID hit, that is where we really understood the challenges that our students with disabilities, especially students who are blind and students who um, were deaf, we recognize the issues that they face. And even though we recognized it, our university management decided that they're going to provide laptops because we didn't realize our students didn't even have access to laptops, didn't have access to internet. But the university came up with a plan where they worked with providers to provide internet access in areas where students did not have it. They also provided loans of laptops so students were able to utilize it. Then again, training was very important. Training for some lecturers, um, training for some students. We just assumed that students were able to navigate and that was not the case. Um, so my department had to actually deal one-on-one -on -one with students to ensure that they were not left behind. We also had attitudes of you know, some lecturers. So for instance, we had a student who is deaf and the lecturer is using Blackboard and she asks him just to, you know, put on captioning. And he just refused. I had to intervene. You know, again, although we had a policy, we still depended on the will and the goodwill of lecturers and academic staff to do what needs to be done. I'm not sure if India has a national policy, but Trinidad and Tobago, we don't have a national policy. In fact, we are now on the stage where we have a draft disability bill. And hopefully when that is passed, our students on our campus and our students anywhere would be able to navigate, will be able to be trained, will be able to have the type of access that they need to have. That's it for me. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, we are naturally segueing into uh, policies and legislation and where that fits. And uh, 
And Swaran, uh, I will ask you to maybe make some comments uh, about that from your perspective, please. Thank you, Gunilla. Thank you very much, Vidya. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gins. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say uh, a big winner for Vakale, which means thank you in Fijian. It's also our independent day today. And you know, um, it sort of resonates with the, with the topic we have today because I don't feel personally as a citizen of the country, I do not feel that we would be able to live a dignified life until everyone, each and every person in the country has access to the basic citizen-centric services that every other person has. And uh, I think that the resilience that um, the people of Trinidad and Tobago have is just amazing. As Dr. Higgins has just mentioned, that uh, there is no national policy at the moment. Actually, uh, I met Dr. Higgins, uh, I think, three to four years ago uh, when I went. Um, I was actually a visitor at the University of West Indies. And that's when I, I, I met this wonderful woman, you know, and she learned, I, I personally learned a lot from her from that one meeting. And one fundamental thing that I had actually learned during that visit was that even though there's no national policy, we need to have people who are continuously there as a support system. Uh, along with Dr. Higgins, I've also met some other uh, people in the university who have told me that um, though there wasn't a disability policy, but we have used other avenues, other legal instruments that were there in terms of, uh, you know, support uh, for, for persons with disabilities. For example, the Education Act that says uh, education is, is accessible to everybody. Everybody means everybody. It also includes persons with, with disabilities. So there are people who firmly believe in inclusion as a basic fundamental human right. And they exercise it through other avenues, not just, as the, not, not just the Disability Act. Uh, if I were to uh, sort of shed some light uh, onto what happened in Fiji, so when we had uh, a bill passed in government for the provisions, for creating provisions for accessibility, or for, for, for the rights of the persons with disability, that was in 2016, into 2018 was when the act came into practice. However, till date, we do not have anything uh, in Britain, in legislation that says that persons with disabilities need to have access in every avenue every avenue in terms of everything that is supposed to be uh, there for a citizen, public uh, amenities, um, you know, uh, uh, social platforms, social media platforms, uh, you know, places where people interact, meet, citizen-centric services, education, uh, and, and many, many other avenues that, uh, that most people enjoy seamlessly. So uh, in Fiji, though, we have uh, the Act, 2018 Act, that says that we need to create the provisions, but it doesn't explicitly say what those, provision, what those provisions should be or um, how to create those provisions. There is nothing that is written that says you need to ensure that all your websites are accessible. So what I've been doing so far is whenever um, I get a, um, you know, an opportunity to speak to um, an audience and I talk to them about inclusion, I do talk to them about OHNS, which is Occupational Health and Safety. It is leg legislation of the country and no organization can bypass that. So we are talking about having accessible uh, entry points in a building, which is great, which is absolutely important. But at the same time, we are, uh, you know, neglecting or we, we, uh, suppose we are not taking into consideration those people who are not there physically. They also need to have access to the amenities. They also, also need to have access to the websites. So accessible website is still something that is, is, that is rather, rather new, a, a very new concept in the Pacific. So I feel we really need to start working in that area. Thank you very much. Uh, there is so much to do. Um, Vidya, could you explain uh, from uh, the Indian perspective on uh, legislation, policies in regard to um, accessibility in education and uh, has that policy and legislation actually been implemented? Yes, uh, from the Indian context, actually now the government is uh, trying to come up with NEP, National Educational Policy, where they're trying to make a lot of changes and inclusion is considered as one of the most important areas. Actually, a lot of people now are trying to get onto uh, inclusive education than having special schools and special uh, education system for the visually impaired, but it's all there, but I'm sure it will take a lot of time to implement it, but the government has started thinking in the right direction. 
one thing about india is that while we were working with schools we cannot go from school uh, to every school and get approval so we are directly working with the state governments we have mou signed with the state governments and they actually send out circulars to all the schools in the states to follow our interventions that's how it's been working what i have seen is in india uh, there are so many states and in each state the policies are very different so in one of the in suppose in one state the special education or education for persons with disabilities will come under the separate department like department of social justice uh, whatever is there in that disability office whatever department there are different departments actually for special for uh, persons with disabilities so sometimes the education comes under that department in few states but in other few state it comes directly under the department of education so these are two different uh, departments and there is nothing like throughout the country it's the same policy sometimes when it is with the education department uh, the accessibility and awareness those aspects are not very much there because it's for general education and even sometimes if it's under the special education department a lot more needs to be done but it's a little bit better so there are all of these constraints that are there there's nothing like uh, nationally everyone is following certain thing it's different for different states but all said and then we have actually signed the rights of persons with convention of rights of persons with disabilities uh, act in 2016 lot needs to be done but it has started i'm not saying that what it was a decade back it's still the same because government is actually trying to make their websites accessible long way to go but it has started um so that's that's currently there and there needs to be something central for special education in the country which right now is not there yes there is certainly a lot to do um and one of the areas that um, we often talk about is universal design and its principles uh, to uh, to ensure that there is uh, uh, design from the start when it comes to um, how a platform um, is accessible for anyone if we take for example in the built environment if we have um, a level entrance to a building uh, instead of stairs that means that it's useful for persons using a wheelchair but it's also useful for uh, someone pushing a pram or a delivery cart and and it's not a special adaptation and that's what we like to see more and more of in the online world and uh, for example here in this room we have captioning and there has been a lot of work done to ensure that there is captioning in these particular sessions but um it's it's essential for a person who has hearing loss but it's really good for anyone who who is um has a language other than english and and needs to have confirmed what is uh, what is being said or maybe there's some facts that they can catch up with on the uh, particular captioning so um i'd like to ask dr huggins uh, your um your thoughts about uh, universal design and its principles in the online learning environment okay, um just just to clarify um we have a national policy 2080 however we don't have any legislation to back that policy so it's like you have a policy but nothing is being done thankfully the draft trinidad and tobago disabilities bill of 2023 will change that now in terms of universal design i my personal thought is it can be done <laughs> it can be done and it is useful for everyone so in terms of uh, our academic staff i would have met with some academic staff and try to show them that based on what they do and how they do it it will allow any student 
to benefit from their delivery. It will allow any student to be able to do that assignment. Um, one of the things we talk about is really the cost. Um, so for instance, my university was built 75 years ago. And how do we retrofit? So that's the physical. We have lecturers who would have started teaching many years ago. And this whole online and internet is very new to them. So how do we change the way they think and understand in terms of meeting the needs of every student within that classroom? So that is something that we continue in terms of um, awareness. We do outreach. We meet with the organization on the campus that provides training for academic staff so that they have a sense websites i am working on a campaign where we are trying to get every faculty's website to be accessible we have new things i i am not sure if you heard of canva and we have some colleagues love to do canva they love to put pictures they love to put blocks and then when they do that a student who is blind their equipment cannot read so it is a constant you must have a watchdog. I call myself a watchdog on that campus. You must have a watchdog that looks and sees and recognize and then speak out, you know, on behalf of students. We also work closely with our students. You know, what are your needs? And we have to meet your needs once we recognize and we said, yes, we are taking you onto this campus. We must recognize your needs. And therefore, we, my department, work very closely with the students that we serve. So we are always lazy with a lecturer. We are always lazy with our deputy principal in terms of changes that must come. Our mantra is that we are going to create a campus without barriers. And that is what we work towards. Universal design is super important. I like your term watchdog. Uh, I, uh, I often use the word um, accessibility champion and uh, I, I, uh, I would encourage uh, any organization <laughs> to ensure that there is either a watchdog or an accessibility champion to keep reminding the fellow staff and uh, within the organization generally uh, to ensure that there is accessibility uh, and that it doesn't slip away. Um, Swaran, would you have any comments on that, please? So I was just listening. It's totally remarkable. Uh, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, as Dr. Higgins had, had uh, previously said, you know, uh, I think it's, it's evidence that legislation on its own is never enough because even without legislation, uh, these, these remarkable women have done so much work. Uh, they have come up with, uh, you know, textbooks. They've come up with uh, a tertiary level education. Uh, uh, if I mean, if, if I may make reference to uh, Professor Harrington Blake, who is in the Faculty of Education. Uh, so uh, I remember when I met her, this is about four years ago, and she had told me that, no, we do not have uh, enough legislation for persons with disabilities specifically, but we do have the Education Act and it says everybody. And that did not stop her. That, that actually uh, was something that she utilized when the term everybody means every citizen of the nation. And that is what you know, um, gave her enough uh, 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 legislation to go ahead and create a tertiary level education, a, a master's degree or a postgraduate degree in inclusion that, that teaches, teaches how to uh, make, make the classes inclusive. So I think this is enough evidence to say that legislation on its own is never enough. We do need the watchdogs. We need people who have to be there constantly ensuring that inclusion becomes part of our DNA. No, it needs to be part of our muscle memory. It needs to be part of our everyday motto and mantra. And nobody has to be left behind because somebody forgot to you know, address the needs of, of, uh, of a particular person. So um, just as the University of West Indies has, we also at Fiji National University have a reasonable, adjust, uh, uh, reasonable adjustable form. Which, in which we, we, we meet uh, a student and then we uh, have, have a discussion, go through some student counseling session. And, uh, but uh, the, the other uh, obstacle we face in that area is that um, the right still remains with the student if they want to declare their disability. And many times we've got these cultural norms, we have these societal norms 
we have challenges around that as well because until and unless somebody declares the disability, there would not be much that we can do to help. That, that does become a barrier. If I could refer to a specific case, I remember teaching a student who exhibited uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, traits, or I wouldn't say symptoms, but traits of uh, a person who has um, um, uh, a, a form of autism. And if I were to be specific on, on uh, because I, I had some discussion with some other teachers, and they told me that it, it seems like that it is autism, but we could not really put a finger on what, what particular type of autism, because until and unless we can do that, we will not be able to create the special provisions that are needed. Uh, so that becomes an obstacle. So when we tried to talk to her parents, the parents uh, had had a very uh, you know an aloof type of uh, um, uh, reaction. They said, "No, my child doesn't have disability." So for them, disability is something to be shunned away, to be kept quiet about. It's something that would be embarrassing, and they feel that if if anybody gets to know that the child is a disability, then it is something that is uh, not something to be proud of. It, it is something that could. Uh, deter people in uh, giving opportunities in the workforce as well. So these are some of the obstacles we are facing. Now, uh, FNU is an ISO um, certified organization. We, we uh, practice ISO 9001 and we've had situations where uh, I remember there was a time when uh, uh, we had uh, a participant in a short course program and she may have been in her early 50s, 50s and she had superannuation. She was actually paying for a course through superannuation. And uh, there were people in the class who came and told me, Madam, it's, it's rather dangerous to keep her in class because she, uh, well, they used rather disturbing terms, but what, what could have been the case was uh, paranoid schizophrenia. So I had other participants coming and telling me that she could be dangerous to keep in class. So then again, we've got another legislation about OHS where we need to protect every participant in the class. And so sometimes we have legislations that sort of contradict with each other, but then um, there comes a point in time for, for like, for example, in my case as a teacher, I, I had to stand, stand my ground and I had to say, no, my student has a constitutional right to be in this class. And if we are not creating the right provisions, then we are people who are not, you know, doing the right thing. But then eventually we had a good dis discussion. This was a thing in 2006. And I remember we still kept that student in class, but the fact that she was using her own, own superannuation, uh, I think it was evidence enough that she was in a sound mind to, to actually work and earn a living for herself. So there's so many things that sort of contradict with each other, with each other as well. But uh, I think in cases like that, we, we probably need another act that stands robust on its own. The fact that we need to create the provisions for persons with disabilities. And that was entailed and enriched within the uh, 2018 Act of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The incident that I'm telling you about happened in 2006. So the only instrument, the only legal instrument I had in order to keep this student of mine in class was the fact that it is a basic right. It is a constitutional right to be in class. But of course, as in many uh, lesser developed countries, as in, as in many uh, economies that are still developing, there will always be a huge gap between what the constitution says that the citizens should have in terms of rights and what the legislation says in terms of what happens when those rights are breached. So we need to, you know, focus on the gaps. We need to focus on the gaps and also find out how to address them. There is a lot to unpack there. And uh, I, <laughs> I think that uh, when it comes to um, uh, the issue of uh, cultural, uh, cultural barriers uh, in terms of um, the general education community understanding um, what it means to have a different type of disability um, and, uh, and uh, the, um, the shunning, the stigma in some cases. Um, Vidya, do you have any comments about that and uh, also in terms of universal design? Uh, yes, as I was already mentioning uh, that, you know, sometimes it's the accessibility specific issues why people are not able to get onto the plat digital platforms or things like that. But sometimes it's also all of these barriers like um, cultural norms, considering it as a stigma. So it, it almost ha happens in all all villages, for example, there is one lady who stays next door um, to my house and she is, she rarely comes out of house. So 40 years, I think now she's almost 40. So 40 years, she's, she's a blind person and she's locked up indoors. 
so there are situations like that uh, and i myself have seen uh, trying to get some women onto digital platforms so that at least they can be connected to the community and when i try to reach out to them uh, in in the initial stages itself there'll be somebody at home picking up the call and not connecting to them so they don't have even that much freedom for them to get onto digital platforms so all of these um, barriers definitely are there and uh, sometimes it's also how we design the technologies you know even social issues are sometimes socially how we want to be there how we want to look for example if you take simple example of a cane some people are not comfortable taking it and walking it walking with it because it looks very different now if if there are some audio specific devices which are too big or which are not very socially um which, which are little what to say they, they're not very socially pleasing to take it in a social setting then people will not like to use them much so some phone for example is a very good example of uh, universal design because on the phone there's talk back there are all sort of accessibility features that are there when you want you can turn it on when you want you can turn it off so phone everybody carries there's nothing um, that prevents you taking it uh, whenever you are in a group or whenever in you are in a social setting so you'll have to consider all of these barriers as well while designing the e learning uh experiences and make it as inclusive and as socially acceptable as possible uh, on what platform you want to design the e-learning experiences so all of these will also have to be factored in and the continuous support for people to use the platforms also is a must sometimes the government runs a lot of programs they distribute laptops they distribute a lot of devices or even some other organizations uh, distributed to students and all the software is installed lms platforms are there but who is going to oversee it whether the st students teachers or whichever person wants to use the platform are they comfortable are they using are they able to use it on a long term basis so all of these will have to surely be considered along with accessibility issues Thank you, Vidya. And uh, I'd like now to bring in uh, uh, Zakari Yama from Morocco, who is uh, a co-organizer of this session and also uh, um, on the leadership team of the Internet Society Accessibility Standing Group. And so um, if Zakari could make some comments about universal design principles too. Thank you. Thank you, Gunala. Thank you, everyone. Uh, some institutions, as uh, said uh, by uh, my predecessor, uh, find it difficult to apply uh, universal design and make it compatible with the accessibility, even though both have the same goal, uh, making access and uh, reduce uh, barriers for, uh, for students. However, uh, the, the scope uh, and method uh, uh, they use uh, vary. For universal design, it focuses on a broad range of learners, while uh, the digital accessibility focuses essentially on uh, learners uh, with the disability. But the, the, the good news is that uh, what is good for persons with, with disability is also good for uh, everyone. When we take, for example, real-time captioning for persons with disability, it is also good for students without disabilities because um, when they have, uh, for example, a difficulty understanding an instructor's uh, accent, it's also good for them when uh, watching a video in a loud environment. When applied with uh, an uh, accessibility mindset, uh, the universal design for uh, learning uh, often lead to the, res the uh, to resulting in uh, benefits for people beyond those in need of uh, a specific uh, accommodation. In my opinion, training institutions should use the accessibility effort as an opportunity to improve the universal design practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zakari. Uh, before we um, go on to talk about the, the broader concept of um, how the internet community can all 
work on making e-learning more accessible. Um, I'd like to open the floor now to uh, persons in the room and online. Um, if there are any comments or questions, so yes, we have one from Lydia Best. Uh, please take the microphone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Lydia Bess and I represent the European Federation of Hard of Hearing People. And I have a question not around just the e-learning in the classroom itself, but also before. So, for example, students have to access internet and online resources teachers provide for them be it assignment, be it whatever materials we need to use. What I have seen, and what is in the UK, that the IT departments in the schools often apply a very heavy-handed way towards accessing the online resources in the schools, between the schools. And that, in fact, is a barrier for those with cognitive disabilities. And, you know, just constantly changing the passwords, constantly changing the way to access, immediately stops for students from accessing vital information and from being able to provide the assignments. And the problem is that nobody actually sees this as a problem, even when you raise it, because it's being seen as, this is simple, this is no problem for anyone, so why do you have a problem? And I think we need to address that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lydia. Um, who would like to take that question? Uh, um, Vidya or Dr. Huggins, uh, Swaran, um, who would like to take that question? What I, would, mm -hmm. what I would like to say is that, you know, I understand what was just said, but on my campus, again, my department, we work closely with IT. Um, you know, we listen to whatever complaints students have and we take it to whichever quarters. So for instance, um, we had students who could not afford um, the software that is needed, the JAWS. So what I did is that I worked with my um, supervisor to gain funding so that we were able to purchase four licenses and we put it in each one of our um, libraries, our computer labs. So our students were able, IT was included so that they had an understanding of why we were using the software, the reason why they need to support the students. So it is also about finding the stakeholders who would listen, finding the stakeholders who would understand and ensure, you know, that what the student needs is what the student gets. There are some equipment that's very expensive that our students cannot purchase. And therefore the university has that responsibility. And once the university has that responsibility, those who are involved in ensuring that it happens, like our IT unit, they are definitely brought on board. So, you know, a lot of what we do, it, it takes, meeting and talking, negotiating, which shouldn't be, it should be, this is what needs to be done. But it takes some of that to ensure that, you know, the students are not frustrated. Um, the students are able to come on campus and they're able to do what they need to do. Thank you. Any other comments um, to that question? Um, again, and I just wanted to just clarify uh, from Lydia once more. So uh, is your question around uh, um, the need of, you know, having to constantly uh, change your passwords or there's too many authentication processes that make it cumbersome for a person with disability to continue, you know, uh, working? Is it something around that? If Lydia could please clarify, uh, yes. I'm just trying to understand. 
It's Lydia speaking, yes, that's correct. So that is even before you go online to participate in your online learning. And, you know, I'm not going to talk about captioning because it's been already said, but it is actually accessing the vital materials the students have um, to get into online library where the teachers um, put in the assignments there for the students. Students yes. get chastised for not f finishing or finalizing the work, but they literally could not remember the passwords. And when they were racing, it, it's a constant battle of, of working right. with the IT to understand that actually you can't keep changing mm. those passwords. You can't keep ramping up security because it creates the barrier for the students. And I have seen it firsthand with my son. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Lydia. I think that's a very valid point. Uh, and uh, you know, additionally, students should never be penalized for that extra time. Uh, that they require in, you know, logging into the system. The, the assessment should, in, in fact, start from the moment that the student has accessed the, the main curriculum. And I, if, you, if you look at uh, certain, if I, if I could speak about certain uh, IT exams, for example, CCNA, Cisco exams, uh, Checkpoint exams, Microsoft exams, uh, if you do the exams, for example, you'll see that you are assessed only for the times that you are actively online. And if there is any sort of technical issue, um, then what, whatever time the technical issue takes, that time would not be, you, you, you wouldn't be held against you. You will be compensated for that time. That's, that's one part of the equation. Now, uh, of course, it's very important for us to be cyber resilient in, in, in today's world. We, we, I cannot emphasize that uh, you know, uh, enough. However, there are so many easier ways of authentication. Um, Thumbprints, uh, you know, uh, tongue scan, retina scan, there's so many different types of easier authentication methods that are specific to that person, uh, face recognition, retina eye recognition, you know, so the, the, these are authentication methods that are specific to the person. So there's really no other way of uh, by, bypassing that. It's very secure and it's easier as well. So I, I fail to understand why would they try to impose such difficult types of uh, authentication methods and waste their time and make it such a deterrent that, that the student would not even want to go back to class. So maybe you should really advocate for this. Thank you very much, Swaran. And there is uh, another question or comment here in the room. Hello, my name is Anna. I'm from Brazil and I work in a child's rights organization. And I would like to hear a little more uh, about Lydia's work with children. And if you can comment about the role of civil society in prom promoting their rights. And you talk about guaranteeing the accessibility since the design too, and it's what that it's what we defend for children too. And but uh, I want to hear about your thoughts about how can we do this and promote this if we don't have the platforms involved involved in this debate, or we don't have persons with disabilities working in those places to to think and promote this these accessible ways, and what is your thought about that? That's a long question, and, uh, and also um, it can be a very long answer, and I think we can, we can uh, um, make it part of the rounding off of this session about how the internet community can encourage collaboration across the globe to make e-learning more accessible for persons with disability and certainly children with disabilities. So I'll pass now over to Vidya. Uh, yes, so um, I feel a little bit to answer the question that you had asked earlier. So when you're talking about children, a lot of times children do not know what they want. So it should be the persons with disabilities who have grown up in similar circumstances or who have gone through the system to tell, the, to tell that this is what the children need. So once, once the child knows that these are the things, because what I have seen is whenever you take any new technology to the child, they are very open-minded, they are not very biased, they have not grown up yet, so they don't have their own assumptions. So whenever you take something new, they pick it up really, really quickly. Um, so I, I don't see why a child who is introduced to computer, who is introduced to Braille, who is introduced to technology, who knows everything, say right from grade one, 
why won't they be able to compete with everyone else say when they reach grade 8 or 9 i mean they can do very much everything in par with everybody else so that's what we are trying to give all of these uh, right from very early age everything that a child has access a child with sight has access we are trying to make it available for children without sight as well and I feel the non-profit organizations have a huge role because they're the bridge between the government and bridge. They know the ground realities working in this space. So it's very much essential for the non-profit organizations to be that bridge and to play their role very effectively. Also, as an internet community, I feel that um, having forums like these where there are people who have expertise in different areas sharing their thoughts, networking, and uh, uh, actually coming up with what are the pressing needs that the community at large has, and actually following up with the networks that we make here and making a meaningful impact together anyone with individually cannot do it so i feel forums like these and the internet community has a huge role to play and it takes time so uh, it's a good starting point thank you very much vidya and it's so important to hear uh, from a person with a lived experience and uh, and the the pathway that uh, vidya took to uh, to become uh, who is now a global advocate, uh, so that's uh, that's very important. Um, I'd like to now pass on uh, in the last uh, last uh, few minutes, uh, just very briefly, um, to Dr. Huggins, uh, just to um, um, give some thought about this encouraging collaboration across the globe, which. Uh, uh, we've already heard about all of those experiences from various different countries and, and how can we continue that collaboration to make e-learning more accessible. Uh, Dr. Huggins. And I, I certainly want to agree with forums like these because this is where I learn and this is where I take back to my university and try to get it implemented. And you know, this organization, you're, there's a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, and we cannot stop. We need to continue. And so, for instance, one of our campus is fully online, and it covers 13 countries in the Caribbean. And students are able to get their degrees. And I believe if we utilize a system like that, you know, little by little, we spread it. I am talking to somebody from India. I'm talking to somebody from Fuji. And we learn from each other. And then we put together what are the best practices. And we start to utilize whatever we learn on these forums. You know, it's not a talk shop. We're going to take back some thoughts. We're going to take back some action. And I think little by little, we stay with this, you know, we stick together and we could get it done. It's going to take some time, like she said, but it's not impossible. Thank you very much. And I will give a final word to uh, Swara Narinda, please. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, finally, uh, I think uh, through, through all this uh, conversation, there's, there's something that I wanted to talk about is affirmative action. We can talk about these things. And you know, last year I met someone at April GF and, and he mentioned that I've been saying the same thing for the 10 years, past 10 years. I think it's time for affirmative action and we can do it together, right? So some of the things that could help is first of all, a disparity measurement. We cannot talk without having proper measurements in front of us. Governments, economies will not listen to us till we have uh, intellectual property that is based on uh, disparity measurements. So uh, basically it's just a simple measurement of how many people are digitally included over how many people who are not. And then there's some, some standards like the world-renowned standard WCAG, to the least if we could try with 1.0, even in places where there's no such thing as digital inclusion ever done. Um, so if we could have web, web content accessibility guidelines 1.0 to start off with. 
Uh, and this one initiative that I wanted to speak to you about is UNESCO's Romex, Romex Indicators, which is an internet universality um, indicated uh, assessment. So uh, we are currently doing this for five Pacific Island nations. And basically it, it's, uh, it, it's based on human rights principles uh, for an internet that is based on human rights. It is open, it, is, it should be accessible to all, and it is nurtured by a multi-stakeholder by multiple st stakeholder participation, as well as some cross-cutting issues like children, gender, uh, security, economy. So this is quite an interesting study. I'm actually part of this. If there's anybody who would like to uh, talk to me about how you could do this, I'll be happy to address your questions later on. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Swaran, and thank you very much uh, to the panel and um, the, um, the audience uh, with your questions. And uh, I think we have learned a lot, um, and we look forward to further collaboration across the globe. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and goodbye. Gendela, sorry, can we just take a photo quickly, please? I also happen to be one of the session organizers, so I have to listen to the presenters. Apologies. Wearing two different shoes today. <laughs> okay, so if you could please take a photo of the audience in the session and also those online. Okay, are we ready? Two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Higgins. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Zakari. Thank you, Gadala. Goodbye. Enjoy Kyoto. Bye.